Book Five, Part One of the Republic by Plato, read by Bob Neufeld. Such is the good and true city or state, and the good and true man is of the same pattern. And if this is right, every other is wrong, and the evil is one which affects not only the ordering of the state, but also the regulation of the individual soul, and is exhibited in four forms. What are they? he said. I was proceeding to tell the order in which the four evil forms appeared to me to succeed one another, when Polymarchus, who was sitting a little way off, just beyond Adamantus, began to whisper to him. Stretching forth his hand, he took hold of the upper part of his coat by the shoulder, and drew him towards him, leaning forward himself so as to be quite close, and saying something in his ear, of which I only caught the words, Shall we let him off, or what shall we do? Certainly not, said Adamantus, raising his voice. Who is it, I said, whom you are refusing to let off? You, he said. I repeated, why am I especially not to be let off? Why, he said, we think that you are lazy, and mean to cheat us out of a whole chapter which is a very important part of the story, and you fancy that we shall not notice your airy way of proceeding, as if it were self-evident to everybody that in the matter of women and children friends have all things in common. And was I not right, Adamantus? Yes, he said. But what is right in this particular case, like everything else, requires to be explained, for community may be of many kinds. Please, therefore, to say what sort of community you mean. We have been long expecting that you would tell us something about the family life of your citizens, how they will bring children into the world and rear them when they have arrived, and in general, what is the nature of this community of women and children. For we are of opinion that the right or wrong management of such matters will have a great and paramount influence on the state for good or for evil. And now, since the question is still undetermined, and you are taking in hand another state, we have resolved, as you heard, not to let you go until you give an account of all this. To that resolution, said Glaucon, you may regard me as saying agreed. And without more ado, said Trisimachus, you may consider us all to be equally agreed. I said, you know not what you are doing in thus assailing me. What an argument are you raising about the state? Just as I thought that I had finished, and was only too glad that I had laid this question to sleep, and was reflecting how fortunate I was in your acceptance of what I then said, you ask me to begin again at the very foundation, ignorant of what a hornet's nest of words you are stirring. Now I foresaw this gathering trouble, and avoided it. For what purpose do you conceive that we have come here? said Trisimachus. To look for gold, or to hear discourse? Yes, but discourse should have a limit. Yes, Socrates, said Glaucon, and the whole of life is the only limit which wise men assign to the hearing of such discourses. But never mind about us. Take heart yourself, and answer the question in your own way. What sort of community of women and children is this which is to prevail among our guardians, and how shall we manage the period between birth and education, which seems to require the greatest care? Tell us how these things will be. Yes, my simple friend, but the answer is the reverse of easy. Many more doubts arise about this than about our previous conclusions, for the practicability of what is said may be doubted, and looked at in another point of view, whether the scheme, if ever so practicable, would be for the best, is also doubtful. Hence I feel a reluctance to approach the subject, lest our aspiration, my dear friend, should turn out to be a dream only. Fear not he replied, for your audience will not be hard upon you. They are not sceptical or hostile. I said, My good friend, I suppose that you mean to encourage me by these words. Yes, he said. Then let me tell you that you are doing just the reverse. 
the encouragement which you offer would have been all very well had i myself believed that i knew what i was talking about to declare the truth about matters of high interest which a man honours and loves among wise men who love him need occasion no fear of faltering in his mind but to carry on an argument when you are yourself only a hesitating inquirer which is my condition is a dangerous and slippery thing and the danger is not that i shall be laughed at of which the fear would be childish but that i shall miss the truth where i have most need to be sure of my footing and drag my friends after me in my fall and i prayed nemesis not to visit upon me the words which i am going to utter for i do indeed believe that to be an involuntary homicide is a less crime than to be a deceiver about beauty or goodness or justice in the matter of laws and that it is a risk which i would rather run among enemies than among friends therefore you do well to encourage me glaucon laughed and said well then socrates in case you and your argument do us any serious injury you shall be acquitted beforehand of the homicide and shall not be held to be a deceiver take courage then and speak well i said the law says that when a man is acquitted he is free from guilt and what holds at law may hold in argument then why should you mind well i replied i suppose that i must retrace my steps and say what i perhaps ought to have said before in the proper place the part of the men has been played out and now properly enough comes the turn of the women of them i will proceed to speak and the more readily since i am invited by you for men born and educated like our citizens the only way in my opinion of arriving at a right conclusion about the possession and use of women and children is to follow the path on which we originally started when we said that the men were to be the guardians and watchdogs of the herd true let us further suppose the birth and education of our women to be subject to similar or nearly similar regulations then we shall see whether the result accords with our design what do you mean what i mean may be put into the form of a question i said are dogs divided into he's and she's or do they both share equally in hunting and in keeping watch and in other duties of dogs or do we entrust to the males the entire and exclusive care of the flocks while we leave the females at home under the idea that the bearing and suckling their puppies is labor enough for them no he said they share alike the only difference between them is that the males are stronger and the females weaker but can you use different animals for the same purpose unless they are bred and fed in the same way you cannot then if women are to have the same duties as men they must have the same nurture and education yes the education which which was assigned to the men was music and gymnastic yes then women must be taught music and gymnastic and also the art of war which they must practice like the men that is the inference i suppose i should rather expect i said that several of our proposals if they are carried out being unusual may appear ridiculous no doubt of it yes and the most ridiculous of all will be the sight of women naked in the palestra exercising with the men especially when they are no longer young they certainly will not be a vision of beauty any more than the enthusiastic old men who in spite of wrinkles and ugliness continue to frequent the gymnasia yes indeed he said according to present notions the proposal would be thought ridiculous but then i said as we have determined to speak our minds we must not fear the jest of the wits which will be directed against this sort of innovation how they will talk of women's attainments both in music and gymnastic and above all about their wearing armour and riding upon horseback very true he replied yet having begun we must go forward to the rough places of the law at the same time begging of these gentlemen for once in their life to be serious not long ago as we shall remind them 
the hellenes were of the opinion which is still generally received among the barbarians that the sight of a naked man was ridiculous and improper and when first the cretans and then the lacedaemonians introduced the custom the wits of that day might equally have ridiculed the innovation no doubt but when experience showed that to let all things be uncovered was far better than to cover them up and the ludicrous effect to the outward eye vanished before the better principle which reason asserted then the man was perceived to be a fool who directs the shafts of his ridicule at any other sight but that of folly and vice or seriously inclines to weigh the beautiful by any other standard but that of the good very true he replied first then whether the question is to be put in jest or in earnest let us come to an understanding about the nature of woman is she capable of sharing either wholly or partially in the actions of men or not at all and is the art of war one of those arts in which she can or cannot share that will be the best way of commencing the inquiry and will probably lead to the fairest conclusion that will be much the best way shall we take the other side first and begin by arguing against ourselves in this manner the adversary's position will not be undefended why not he said then let us put a speech into the mouths of our opponents they will say socrates and glaucard no adversary need convict you for you yourselves at the first foundation of the state admitted the principle that everybody was to do the one work suited to his own nature and certainly if i am not mistaken such an admission was made by us and do not the natures of men and women differ very much indeed and we shall reply of course they do then we shall be asked whether the tasks assigned to men and to women should not be different and such as are agreeable to their different natures certainly they should but if so have you not fallen into a serious inconsistency in saying that men and women whose natures are so entirely different ought to perform the same actions what defence will you make for us my good sir against any one who offers these objections that is not an easy question to answer when asked suddenly and i shall and i do beg of you to draw out the case on our side these are the objections glaucon and there are many others of a like kind which i foresaw long ago they made me afraid and reluctant to take in hand any law about the possession and nurture of women and children by zeus he said the problem to be solved is anything but easy why yes i said but the fact is that when a man is out of his depth whether he has fallen into a little swimming bath or into mid-ocean he has to swim all the same very true and must not we swim and try to reach the shore we will hope that arian's dolphin or some other miraculous help may save us i suppose so he said well then let us see if any way of escape can be found we acknowledged did we not that different natures ought to have different pursuits and that men's and women's natures are different and now what are we saying that different natures ought to have the same pursuits this is the inconsistency which is charged upon us precisely verily glaucon i said glorious is the power of the art of contradiction why do you say so because i think that many a man falls into the practice against his will when he thinks that he is reasoning he is really disputing just because he cannot define and divide and so know that of which he is speaking and he will pursue a merely verbal opposition in the spirit of contention and not a fair discussion yes he replied such is very often the case but what has that to do with us and our argument a great deal for there is certainly a danger of our getting unintentionally into a verbal opposition in what way why we valiantly and pugnaciously insist upon the verbal truth that different natures ought to have different pursuits but we never considered at all what was the meaning of sameness or difference of nature or why we distinguished them when we assigned different pursuits to different natures and the same to the same natures why no he said that was never considered by us 
I said, suppose that by way of illustration we were to ask the question whether there is not an opposition in nature between bald men and hairy men and if this is admitted by us then if bald men are cobblers we should forbid the hairy men to be cobblers and conversely that would be a jest he said yes i said a jest and why because we never meant when we constructed the state that the opposition of natures should extend to every difference but only to those differences which affected the pursuit in which the individual is engaged we should have argued for example that a physician and one who is in mind a physician may be said to have the same nature true whereas the physician and the carpenter have different natures certainly and if i said the male and female sex appear to differ in their fitness for any art or pursuit we should say that such pursuit or art ought to be assigned to one or the other of them but if the difference consists only in women bearing and men begetting children this does not amount to a proof that a woman differs from a man in respect to the sort of education she should receive and we shall therefore continue to maintain that our guardians and their wives ought to have the same pursuits very true he said next we shall ask our opponent how in reference to any of the pursuits or arts of civic life the nature of a woman differs from that of a man that will be quite fair and perhaps he like yourself will reply that to give a sufficient answer on the instant is not easy but after a little reflection there is no difficulty yes perhaps suppose then that we invite him to accompany us in the argument and then we may hope to show him that there is nothing peculiar in the constitution of women which would affect them in the administration of the state by all means let us say to him come now and we will ask you a question when you spoke of a nature gifted or not gifted in any respect did you mean to say that one man will acquire a thing easily another with difficulty a little learning will lead the one to discover a great deal whereas the other after much study and application no sooner learns than he forgets or again did you mean that the one has a body which is a good servant to his mind while the body of the other is a hindrance to him would not these be the sort of differences which distinguish the man gifted by nature from the one who is ungifted no one will deny that and can you mention any pursuit of mankind in which the male sex has not all these gifts and qualities in a higher degree than the female need i waste time in speaking of the art of weaving and the management of pancakes and preserves in which womankind does really appear to be great and in which for her to be beaten by a man is of all things the most absurd you are quite right he replied in maintaining the general inferiority of the female sex although many women are in many things superior to many men yet on the whole what you say is true and if so my friend i said there is no special faculty of administration in a state which a woman has because she is a woman or which a man has by virtue of his sex but the gifts of nature are alike diffused in both all the pursuits of men are the pursuits of women also but in all of them a woman is inferior to a man very true then are we to impose all our enactments on men and none of them on women that will never do one woman has a gift of healing another not one is a musician and another has no music in her nature very true and one woman has a turn for gymnastics and military exercises and another is unwarlike and hates gymnastics certainly and one woman is a philosopher and another is an enemy of philosophy one has spirit and another is without spirit that is also true then one woman will have the temper of a guardian and another not was not the selection of the male guardians determined by differences of this sort yes men and women alike possess the qualities which make a guardian they differ only in their comparative strength or weakness obviously and those women who have such qualities are to be selected as the companions and colleagues of men who have similar qualities and whom they resemble in capacity and in character 
very true and ought not the same natures to have the same pursuits they ought then as we were saying before there is nothing unnatural in assigning music and gymnastic to the wives of the guardians to that point we come round again certainly not the law which we then enacted was agreeable to nature and therefore not an impossibility or mere aspiration and the contrary practice which prevails at present is in reality a violation of nature that appears to be true we had to consider first whether our proposals were possible and secondly whether they are the most beneficial yes and the possibility has been acknowledged yes the very great benefit was next to be established quite so you will admit that the same education which makes a man a good guardian will make a woman a good guardian for their original nature is the same yes i should like to ask you a question what is it would you say that all men are equal in excellence or is one man better than another the latter and in the commonwealth which we are founding do you conceive the guardians who have been brought up on our model system to be more perfect men or the cobblers whose education has been cobbling what a ridiculous question you have answered me i replied well and may we not further say that our guardians are the best of our citizens by far the best and will not their wives be the best women yes by far the best and can there be anything better for the interests of the state than that the men and women of the state should be as good as possible there can be nothing better and this is what the arts of music and gymnastic when present in such manner as we have described will accomplish certainly then we have made an enactment not only possible but in the highest degree beneficial to the state true then let the wives of our guardians strip for their virtue will be their robe and let them share in the toils of war and the defence of their country only in the distribution of labours the lighter are to be assigned to the women who are the weaker natures but in other respects their duties are to be the same and as for the man who laughs at naked women exercising their bodies from the best of motives in his laughter he is plucking a fruit of unripe wisdom and he himself is ignorant of what he is laughing at or what he is about for that is and ever will be the best of sayings that the useful is the noble and the hurtful is the base very true here then is one difficulty in our law about women which we may say that we have now escaped the wave has not swallowed us up alive for enacting that the guardians of either sex should have all the pursuits in common to the utility and also to the possibility of this arrangement the consistency of the argument with itself bears witness yes that was a mighty wave which you have escaped yes i said but a greater is coming you will not think much of this when you see the next go on let me see the law i said which is the sequel of this and of all that has preceded is to the following effect that the wives of our guardians are to be common and their children are to be common and no parent is to know his own child nor any child his parent yes he said that is a much greater wave than the other and the possibility as well as the utility of such a law are far more questionable i do not think i said that there can be any dispute about the very great utility of having wives and children in common the possibility is quite another matter and will be very much disputed i think that a good many doubts may be raised about both you imply that the two questions must be combined i replied now i meant that you should admit the utility and in this way as i thought i should escape from one of them and then there would remain only the possibility but that little attempt is detected and therefore you will please to give a defence of both well i said i submit to my fate yet grant me a little favour let me feast my mind with the dream as daydreamers are in the habit of feasting themselves when they are walking alone 
for before they have discovered any means of affecting their wishes, that is, a matter which never troubles them, they would rather not tire themselves by thinking about possibilities. But assuming that what they desire is already granted to them, they proceed with their plan, and delight in detailing what they mean to do when their wish has come true. That is a way which they have of not doing much good to a capacity which was never good for much. Now, I myself am beginning to lose heart, and I should like, with your permission, to pass over the question of possibility at present. Assuming, therefore, the possibility of the proposal, I shall now proceed to inquire how the rulers will carry out these arrangements, and I shall demonstrate that our plan, if executed, will be of the greatest benefit to the State and to the guardians. First of all, then, if you have no objection, I will endeavour, with your help, to consider the advantages of the measure, and hereafter the question of possibility. I have no objection. Proceed. First, I think that if our rulers and our auxiliaries are to be worthy of the name which they bear, there must be willingness to obey in the one, and the power of command in the other. The guardians must themselves obey the laws, and they must also imitate the spirit of them in any details which are entrusted to their care. That is right, he said. You, I said, who are their legislator, having selected the men, will now select the women and give them to them. They must be as far as possible of like natures with them. They must live in common houses and meet at common meals. None of them will have anything specially his or her own. They will be together, and will be brought up together, and will associate at gymnastic exercises. And so they will be drawn by a necessity of their natures to have intercourse with each other. Necessity is not too strong a word, I think. Yes, he said, necessity, not geometrical, but another sort of necessity which lovers know, and which is far more convincing and constraining to the mass of mankind. True, I said. And this Glaucon, like all the rest, must proceed after an orderly fashion. In a city of the blessed, licentiousness is an unholy thing which the rulers will forbid. Yes, he said, and it ought not to be permitted. Then clearly the next thing will be to make matrimony sacred in the highest degree, and what is most beneficial will be deemed sacred. Exactly. And how can marriages be made most beneficial? That is a question which I put to you, because I see in your house dogs for hunting, and of the nobler sort of birds not a few. Now, I beseech you, do tell me, have you ever attended to their pairing and breeding? In uh, what particulars? Why, in the first place, although they are all of a good sort, are not some better than others? True. And do you breed from them all indifferently? Or do you take care to breed from the best only? Well, from the best. And do you take the oldest or the youngest, or only those of ripe age? I choose only those of ripe age. And if care was not taken in the breeding, your dogs and birds would greatly deteriorate? Certainly. And the same of horses and animals in general? Undoubtedly. "'Good heavens! My dear friend,' I said, "'what consummate skill will our rulers need "'if the same principle holds of the human species?' "'Certainly the same principle holds, "'but why does this involve any particular skill?' "'Because,' I said, "'our rulers will often have to practice "'upon the body corporate with medicines. "'Now, you know that when patients do not require medicines "'but have only to be put under a regimen, the inferior sort of practitioner is deemed to be good enough, but when medicine has to be given, then the doctor should be more of a man. That is quite true, he said, but to what are you alluding? I mean, I replied, that our rulers will find a considerable dose of falsehood and deceit necessary for the good of their subjects. We were saying that the use of all these things regarded as medicines might be of advantage and we were very right, and this lawful use of them seems likely to be often needed in the regulations of marriages and births. How so? Why, I said, 
the principle has already been laid down that the best of either sex should be united with the best as often and the inferior with the inferior as seldom as possible and that they should rear the offspring of the one sort of union but not of the other if the flock is to be maintained in first-rate condition now these goings-on must be a secret which the rulers only know and there will be a further danger of our herd as the guardians may be termed breaking out into rebellion very true had we not better appoint certain festivals at which we will bring together the brides and bridegrooms and sacrifices will be offered and suitable high menial songs composed by our poets the number of weddings is a matter which must be left to the discretion of the rulers whose aim will be to preserve the average of population there are many other things which they will have to consider such as the effects of wars and diseases and similar agencies in order as far as this is possible to prevent the state from becoming either too large or too small certainly he replied we shall have to invent some ingenious kind of lots which the less worthy may draw on each occasion of our bringing them together and then they will accuse their own ill luck but not the rulers to be sure he said and i think that our braver and better youth besides their other honors and rewards might have greater facilities of intercourse with women given them their bravery will be a reason and such fathers ought to have as many sons as possible true and the proper officers whether male or female or both for offices are to be held by women as well as by men yes the proper officers will take the offspring of the good parents to the pen or fold and there they will deposit them with certain nurses who dwell in a separate quarter but the offspring of the inferior or of the better when they chance to be deformed will be put away in some mysterious unknown place as they should be yes he said that must be done if the breed of the guardians is to be kept pure they will provide for their nurture and will bring the mothers to the fold when they are full of milk taking the greatest possible care that no mother recognizes her own child and other wet nurses may be engaged if more are required care will also be taken that the process of suckling shall not be protracted too long and the mothers will have no getting up at night or other trouble but will hand over all this sort of thing to the nurses and attendants you suppose the wives of our guardians to have a fine easy time of it when they are having children why said i and so they ought let us however proceed with our scheme we were saying that the parents should be in the prime of life very true and what is the prime of life may it not be defined as a period of about twenty years in a woman's life and thirty in a man's which years do you mean to include a woman i said at twenty years of age may begin to bear children to the state and continue to bear them until forty a man may begin at five and twenty when he has passed the point at which the pulse of life beats quickest and continue to beget children until he be fifty-five certainly he said both in men and women those years are the prime of physical as well as of intellectual vigor any one above or below the prescribed ages who takes part in the public hymenials shall be said to have done an unholy and unrighteous thing the child of which he is the father if it steals into life will have been conceived under auspices very unlike the sacrifices and prayers which at each hymenial priestesses and priest and the whole city will offer that the new generation may be better and more useful than their good and useful parents whereas his child will be the offspring of darkness and strange lust very true he replied and the same law will apply to any one of those within the prescribed age who forms a connection with any woman in the prime of life without the sanction of the rulers for we shall say that he is raising up a bastard to the state uncertified and unconsecrated very true he replied this applies however only to those who are within the specified age after that we allow them to range at will except that a man may not bury his daughter or his daughter's daughter 
or his mother or his mother's mother and women on the other hand are prohibited from marrying their sons or fathers or son's son or father's father and so on in either direction and we grant all this accompanying the permission with strict orders to prevent any embryo which may come into being from seeing the light and if any force away to the birth the parents must understand that the offspring of such an union cannot be maintained and arrange accordingly that also he said is a reasonable proposition but how will they know who are fathers and daughters and so on they will never know the way will be this dating from the day of the hymeneal the bridegroom who was then married will call all the male children who are born in the seventh and tenth month afterwards his sons and the female children his daughters and they will call him father and he will call their children his grandchildren and they will call the elder generation grandfathers and grandmothers all who were begotten at the time when their fathers and mothers came together will be called their brothers and sisters and these as i was saying will be forbidden to intermarry this however is not to be understood as an absolute prohibition of the marriage of brothers and sisters if the lot favours them and they receive the sanction of the pythian oracle the law will allow them quite right he replied such is the scheme glaucon according to which guardians of our state are to have their wives and families in common and now you would have the argument show that this community is consistent with the rest of our polity and also that nothing can be better would you not yes certainly shall we try to find a common basis by asking of ourselves what ought to be the chief aim of the legislator in making laws and in the organization of the state what is the greatest good and what is the greatest evil and then consider whether our previous description has the stamp of the good or of the evil by all means End of book five part one